welcome to, to another Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Beautiful to look out these windows, even if we're seeing fog in the near view here. Believe it or not, there's a Marin County on the other side of that fog line. And first up, let's introduce our Commodore, Paul Heineken. Going up, Paul. Thanks. First, I have to thank Jimmy for this marvelous hat he gave me. Uh, Jimmy DeWitt. Jimmy DeWitt, our senior uh, in residence artist over there at the right. corner. And there, so it ruins, absolutely ruins any artistic view of that head. Um, but uh, no, I just am here to welcome you to another one of Ron's wonderful uh, events. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing our speaker today. And around the club, what's been happening, we had a fabulous Commodore's Ball last Saturday night. Uh, speakeasy model, everybody had, seemed to have a good time. And then Tuesday, we're having the big sale. Cal versus Stanford, right out here. It'd be wonderful if we had this breeze. And it's a very exciting day down here with bands and cheerleaders and everything. Uh, Ron started this many years ago at one of these Wednesday Osmond's lunches, although it was Tuesday at the time. And uh, he's really the grandfather and uh, idea guy behind it, as he is for so many things. So uh, come on down Tuesday, and, uh, and then it's all holiday stuff. So we're having a great time here at the club. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, mate. Good on you, Paul. Everybody knows that our, our Commodore Paul is a great sailor and has sired great sailors. Only two of his two children are world champions. Um, but Paul is also a relative... Uh, to the, as we know, Heineken uh, beer business. And uh, one of my dearest friends in the world is here today, and he actually founded the microbrewing movement. He would never say these words, but I can. Uh, he founded Anchor Steam Beer years ago, Fritz Maytag. Welcome here, Fritz. <laughs> now, it's one thing to found a movement, but it's another altogether to found two. And he also founded the micro distilling movement. You can't go into a liquor store now without seeing all kinds of craft distilleries. And back in the 90s, he uh, created Old Petrero whiskey and then London Fog uh, gin and incredibly delicious craft spirits have come from Fritz's uh, brain and craftsmanship. And the whole movement of micro distilling owes a thank you to my buddy Fritz Maytag. Again, friends, thank you. I'm making his natural um, Iowa modesty um, you know, show. Uh, let's see a little bit about future speakers. Um, yes, next week you want to come by because you wondered who invented the trim tab. That is to say the little racing innovation um, in the 60s uh, that basically fits on the back of a keel and looks like a beginning of a rudder. Well, that trim tab, which helps create an aerodynamic foil out of an otherwise normal keel, was invented by our speaker next week, Dick Carter. He's in town with his new book, and uh, the New York Times once called him the mystery man in American yachting. He'll be here to tell us all about that and many other innovations that came from his drawing board. And then on December 4, please come by to see Michael Ellis. Michael, of course, the naturalist that's uh, been all over uh, the world many times. He leads great tours of a dozen people or so to the far reaches of the planet and is on KQED quite frequently, KQED radio and television, and is a good buddy and he's an incredible speaker. So you want to come by on December 4 to hear him. Now a little bit about our speaker today. So it's always amazing to look at when people get the bug for what will be their profession and how many other early you know, curves there were on their path. He first got in a sailboat or a boat of any kind when he was six months old, not his choice, but he was on a transatlantic cruise from New York to Southampton. So getting close to Southampton caused him to be credential enough to want to be a speaker at the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. So we are happy to have him come on that occasion. But also from six to 15, he was sailing a sunfish. Who sailed a sunfish? Okay, at one time, the most populous boat in the world, and you know how to sail if you sail a sunfish any length of time whatsoever. But he spent time dodging about in one in a, a lake in Connecticut that his uncle, where his uncle had a house. And then at age 20, he started sailing around in Annapolis on a little 21-foot rainbow sailor and discovered at age 23 that he did not get sick on powerboats. And he co crossed over to the dark side upon that occasion and has been really powerboat oriented since. We are not holding that against him. 
we do have friends who have power boats. Some of us <laughs> admit to it. Um, he spent some time on other sailboats, the Catalina 36, but really, um, you know, that really wasn't going to be his cup of tea. But maps, that began to get to him because his brother became the chairman of the geography department at the University of Kentucky. His wife, that is to say, our speaker's sister-in-law, had previously been the chair of the geography department. His father was a dean of the School of Science, uh, Department of Science at Penn State. His mom uh, founded a music academy. And so the kid had all kinds of incredibly bright people whispering in his ear as he grew up. And so by the time he was 12, living in Holland, he started getting really fascinated with maps and knew that he wanted to travel a lot. And if you're a kid and you want to travel and you listen to music, the ideal possible job would be to become a roadie on a rock band. So he started doing that at age 23 and started touring the world and carting around equipment, first as a driver of trucks and vans, then as a schlepper of equipment, pretty soon as a stage manager, and ultimately was a stage manager and road manager for a few people we've heard of, like Metallica and the Rolling Stones and Miles Davis and Chick Corea, et cetera. A big, long laundry list of great stars where he was the roadie and the traveling uh, sort of um, uh, equipment manager and stage manager. Around 2003, by this time he had a logistics company, and around 2003, he wanted no more of that. He said, no, 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 and bought an adorable little shop on Grant Avenue where I have visited Shine and Shine Maps, antique maps. And he and his wife, Marty, who were, who's here as well, set up this cute little shop, and the storefront is around the size of this of our room, and inside of it is all manner of incredibly exotic maps. They only have 9,000 maps in the little shop, and all, all over the world, and about 4,000 books, and they have a, a kind of carriage trade of clients, including, you know, uh, Diane Feinstein and, and uh, Stanley Gotti and Carlos Santana. So they're purveyors of antique maps and antique books. Now, those of you who came and listened to my talk, uh, historic talk on um, they came for the gold, they stayed for the yachting, the birth of racing in San Francisco Bay, know that I, a long time ago, became addicted to looking at how the shape of San Francisco's, you know, sky view of San Francisco kept changing with water fill. Uh, water lots turned into land, and San Francisco kept changing its shape. So I started hunting for how could I figure out, you know, who knows more about this? And with a couple of archaeology buddies, and then a Wednesday yachting speaker, who came and told us all about how to be a, a bar pilot, he heard of this interest and he said, no, you got to meet Jimmy Shine. And so I don't think we could find a more authoritative person to tell us how San Francisco's shoreline and ultimately shape has changed than somebody who can show us from the first maps to now. And so uh, I welcome you and our, our speaker today, Jimmy Shine. Jimmy, come on up. Hi, and welcome. I am super excited to be here. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Hold the mic closer. Good. I'm not a big mic guy. Uh, and I generally just speak loudly enough that people can hear me. Uh, I've assembled a, a collection of both maps and images that um, strike me as both unusual uh, and um, having a love affair with maps for 30, 40 years now. Um, I found many of them are things that we don't get to see very frequently. In many cases, we haven't seen at all. And I, I would think that perhaps we should um, because they're uh, generally speaking uh, the first maps of the Bay. Um, I moved here from elsewhere when I was a teenager and at that time in the late 70s San Francisco was kind of a an industrial city transitioning into a banking city uh, which transitioned into something else and we've, about every 10 years it seems the city changes quite a bit um, and historically that's actually been the case. When we look at San Francisco um, in its inceptions uh, we want to look at perhaps the first discoveries and why we were here. Uh, San Francisco Bay being discovered um, not by the sailors who were running out that ocean there, but in fact by people who were coming overland. Is everybody aware of that story? Um, it's a marvelous story, and the fact that the bay is discovered by people not in boats, but by people who overshot Monterey and wound up up at 
the top of the ridge, the Malagra Ridge, and, and spied San Francisco Bay. It was enough, there was a man with them by the name of Friar Juan Crespi, um, that it provoked his interest, and when they returned and, and subsequently went back to Monterey, it provoked an interest in really coming up here and mapping it. And so the first map we know of San Francisco Bay will be um, the 1772 Friar Juan Crispy map of San Francisco Bay. Um, this map has an orientation with north to the left, all right? And I kind of, can everybody see it? And is the detail clear enough? Um, for me, uh, what I want to point out is on the bottom right center, uh, we see the Fairlawns. The Fairlawns will always be the reference point. Um, we sail 20, 30 miles offshore. Our shoreline is craggy and it has waves and potentially uh, unhospitable uh, hosts. So we stay offshore and the Fairlawns are a resource for both reference as well as a resource for materials, uh, eggs, uh, turtles, uh, sea lions, and fish. So the reference to the map, um, let's put the map back up. Uh, we see uh, uh, it's rather small, so I'm going to have to translate it myself. This bottom circle, uh, we have two circles. This bottom circle is entitled the Bahia de San Francisco, the Bay of San Francisco. Now, that Bay of San Francisco, um, as described by Friar, Friar Juan Crespi, is in fact the Golden Gate. It is in fact the area from Point Reyes, the King's Point, down to, uh, on this one it would be the Punta uh, Almes, Almejas, A-M-E-L-J-A-S, um, Muscle Point. We call it San Pedro Point today. So the Golden Gate in the minds of the first Spanish explorers um, runs at the center between the Punta Reyes and the Muscle Point. Um, this is what this bottom circle is indicating. We then go in and at the mouth, we actually have a series of islands represented, and that would be Angel Island and Alcatraces, um, Blossom Rock, Shag Rock, Anita Rock. Um, those are all rocks that are known to us. We know these, some of them we've blown up. So um, this first map of, uh, of the bay is in fact showing uh, the fair lines. It's showing the islands at the entrance to the bay. Um, and if we take a left, it's showing us San Pablo Bay, taking us uh, through the Carquina Straits and up into the Delta and eventually um, into the Sierras. Now, the Sierras on this map are indicated as seen from. And when we get back to the Delta, we see there's some language up at the top of the little mountains by the Delta area. And what it says there is this is as far as the expedition went. This is as far as we actually went at this time. But we see the mountains in the distance and we see that we can get there from waterways. Um, it's this club that has an island out in the Delta. Um, how apropos uh, that we would be both in the Golden Gate and out in the Delta, and that that was perceived. Remembering um, at this time, it's 1772, um, the rest of Europe, France, England, Ireland, Germany, uh, Switzerland, Italy, have just spent the previous two generations uh, with the whole culture of canal digging digging ditches so that they could fill them with water and float goods to market. We've just discovered an inland waterway that takes us all the way to the mountains, potentially 300 miles. We didn't have to do a thing for it. This is a big discovery. And the transfer of goods and the ability to transport uh, everything around us, it should merit pointing out at this time in the 1770s, um, San Francisco is a sand dune, and all the land around us to the north and to the east is redwood forest. So our Marin Hills, of which we have mere woods left, were in fact entirely redwoods um, with patches of non-redwood area. I love visualizing these things because the um, physical plane that we live in uh, has many great similarities today, but many things are quite different. And the loss of those great trees, of course, um, was very early on. Um, the earliest of settlers, earliest of colonialists made use of them. Um, our first land barons, Mariano Vallejo and his brothers, uh, they dealt in leather and wood. Everything was made out of leather and wood. These are good things to deal in. And if you have a port town, then you can put those to market. So those were the early San Franciscan con construct, and we'll get to that. Um, 
let me, I'm going to have to do a little bit of manual stuff here, and so you'll forgive me while I go to the next map. And this is a map done just a few years later, and this was the map that was created by a crew member. Uh, now north is oriented at the top, and we have great similarity, and the crudeness of this map is rather interesting. It's a simple line drawing. It's so simple. Uh, for me, as a young person, I had difficulty with negative and positive space. Eschers were almost impossible for me to understand, truly. Um, it wasn't until I was older that my brain developed, and so a map like this was always very challenging. That's why I got interested in maps, why um, I couldn't tell what was land and what was water. Uh, but this map individually um, was found only as late as about 30 years ago in the archives of Seville, where the majority of early California records are kept, and it was made by a crew member. It is unattributed. And what we find is often unattributed things have great value. We look at this one, and north is at the top, and we see that we come in even superficially from this distance. I can see there are islands at the mouth. We can see the Golden Gate on the left. We start to see um, uh, creeks and rivers coming into the South Bay. Uh, interestingly, I forgot to point out on the previous map, the South Bay is called the Grand Estero. And the bay itself is the Golden Gate, and that which is inside the gate is interpreted as an estuary, a great big estuary, which essentially is true. When we look at this second map, we see that what's really important now is water. Um, we have a pathway. We know where we are. We're going to be coming back and forth, but we need water. And so water is always going to be very, very relevant. A couple of commands, and now we're at a point where those two maps that I've just shown you are proprietary. In fact, the Spanish didn't share them with anybody until the 1840s. They were stored in Seville, and if you wanted to see them before about 1965, you had to go to Seville. That's how proprietary maps were, and particularly the Bay. Um, by the 1770s, um, there's competition for proprietary colonialism. And the French have come along, and a man by the name of La Perouse comes and sails the west coast of the U.S. along with Captain Cook and Dixon, who are all doing this around the 1770s, 1780s. Here is a map that is a little less abstract, um, but it also is as abstract as they come. If you can't tell negative, uh, yeah, let me, thank you. Yep, go in a couple more. So. Um, we see at the top of the map is the delta. We see to the right of the map is the South Bay. And at the bottom of the map is the Golden Gate and the entrance. And what we see on the lower left is Drake's Bay or Point Reyes, uh, the King's Point. And what we see on the right is Lake Merced. Um, Lake Merced um, has shows that it is an estuary with connections to the ocean, meaning that the water there is brackish. All other water that's indicated there is being serviced by springs or creeks. Having traveled 12,000 miles to get here, again, water is very important. But this is the first map done by an alternative colonial power. This is the first map that anybody else saw of San Francisco Bay. It was published in 1798. Has anybody seen this map before? Okay, It's marvelous because it's, <laughs> thank you, my wife Marty has indeed seen it. Um, <laughs> She's paying attention these 30 years. Uh, that map is fascinating to me because I've seen it my whole life, um, but it is so abstract in its negative positive space. To me, if we can throw it on the screen again, it simply was titled The Map of the Seven Rabbits because what I saw was rabbits in outline. That upper right hand is the rabbit, and, that, and there's a, the thumper there on the left. He's the delta's thumper. He's a rabbit. And then the mouth, there's another. And then, of course, Lake Merced is the mouth of a big cat that's going to eat those rabbits, right? And, and, the, and the eye up at the top uh, is Laguna de los Dolores. So the lake that is down in the mission is, in fact, the eye to the cat. Everybody sees the cat, right? Um, so the mouth is uh, Lake Merced. Um, the nostril creek is Lobos Creek. Um, and the eye is the Laguna de los Dolores, which is a, a lake in the mission that's fed by Mission Creek, which comes down 18th Street and feeds into the neighborhood. And as early as the 1850s and 1860s, that part of town, if we can visualize 17th and Mission or even Dolores Park, 18th and uh, Dolores, those were tidally influenced water lots. All right? 
So the tide came all the way into that point in Mission Creek. And I point it out because the origins of this particular boat club are down at Hobbs's Wharf on the Long Bridge in Mission Bay. So that would put it in the middle of this flooding tide, um, surrounded a mile in all directions by about three feet of water, um, and this tide coming in and floating all the way in uh, down Division Street and into the Mission to what would be the Eye of the Cat. So um, those are things that are uh, being told in these early maps that are fascinating because other things on this map also indicate that Rincon Hill, where the Bay Bridge is connected, is actually almost an island because the, the tide level is high enough in the 1770s that it's coming around the backside. And most of south of Market is a peat bog, a peat bog that's 40 feet deep in water and 8 feet th thick in peat. Everybody knows what peat is, right? It's what the Irish burn. It's an anaerobic environment. It's a, an environment that is devoid of oxygen. So as all the debris and dead plants blow from this sand dune that is San Francisco, it comes down south of market and gets caught in this anaerobic environment and it sits there and, and doesn't decompose, it turns to peat. So this is the last map, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, shows, it's the last map to show what we were doing to sail at this time. And what I mean is a sail, a, a vessel is filled with uh, sailors, um, many of whom don't know how to swim, but it's also filled with children between the ages of 12 and 15. And their primary task is to count in one capacity or another. One young man has a rope on a stick. Another young man has another rope on a stick of a different dimension. Another young man has an hourglass. These people are set with rote tasks to keep time because prior to the invention of accurate timekeeping on a vessel, we used an hourglass and that had to be turned by an individual and maintained by a person and that was actually left to the apprentices on the vessels in many cases. And so we see irregularities in longitude greatly until age three, when is the 1820 period, um, when we have the capacity through a spring to have a vessel that can keep accurate time and subsequently give us accurate longitude in the daytime particularly. So um, all of those jobs, uh, were rote tasks, and this map represents really the last generation of rote maps because when we come to the next map, which is one we'll stick with for just a second, the Beachy map is an 1828 map made by the English, and we'll come in a bit so that we can get over to our Golden Gate. And we have an incredible increase of detail. The difference in 20 years is rather striking. Um, this is the 1828 Beachy map, and this essentially would be just after Humboldt came through here in about 2024, and it was deemed by the English that they have uh, Drake's Bay, and they might have a colonial interest in California, and they should probably do a little exploration. Um, it is also post H3, and subsequently, we have incredible longitudinal accuracy. It is also a period where we're not using quadrants anymore, we're using sextants. And that change in equipment and the tolerances, going into a metal tolerances of microns as opposed to a wooden tolerances of millimeters, uh, changes everything in map making and we see that. And San Francisco, of course, is a very important subject matter for that. So um, on this map, um, it's kind of fun. I'm going to command it just a little bit bigger so you guys can see. Uh, we have uh, Fort Point. Um, we have a line of delineation from Fort Point to Alcatraz. This is 1828. Now anybody, we've got so many yachtsmen in here. I don't know if you guys still even pay attention to that. Um, but it was the recommended approach to the Golden Gate that you would line up Fort Point and Alcatraz and you would stay in that line. And to travel north of that was to risk running into the shores. Um, as a result, the first lighthouses on the west coast are Alcatraz and Fort Point. And we have a great privilege there. Um, both still working and so both still relevant. Uh, this map shows the importance of the placement there. But at this time, there is no light on either. Uh, we see from Fort Point, it goes all the way east and it goes to Yerba Buena. Uh, Yerba Buena Island is listed and Yerba Buena Cove is listed because this is 1828, 
the name San Francisco does not appear anywhere on this map because the name San Francisco would not be applied to land yet, right? So this is a marvelous map. It shows our mission. It actually has some buildings. Um, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. We see Blue Mountain at 1087. And if we go up to Table Mountain, or Table Hill, as they call it, that would be Mount Tam at 2870, the third triangulation in that very important cognizance is Mount Diablo, right? And with that, we have the first triangulation to allow survey of the bay. We have to have triangulation, and here we have it. Blue Mountain is Twin Peaks, Table Mountain is Mount Tam, and Mount Diablo actually may have a different name on this map, uh, but um, it becomes Diablo very quickly. Yes, they do have another name for it. They call it uh, Sierra Bulldogos. Um, I don't know why. I, I really have no idea why they don't use Mount Diablo. Mount Diablo was assigned to that um, very early on, but they're assigning their own name to it. Um, this map, with its accuracy, is marvelous uh, because we're getting to the time where we have um, this a little Fremont map that I popped up. And the reason I did is because just in this little insert, um, we have, let me hit the green, we have um, the Chrysophily right? Does anybody use that term at all? Have, have any of you heard of it before? Yeah, no, the yacht name Chrysophily. Very good. All right. So does anybody know what the Chrysoceros is? All right. So um, all trade going from Europe to Asia on the Silk Road went through a bottleneck. That bottleneck was Constantinople or Istanbul. The creation of the Byzantine Empire was based in this. The northern section of this triangulation of the Byzantine Empire is an area called the Golden Horn. All right, the Golden Horn is the Chrysoceros. Um, a member of the Wilkes Exploratory Expedition of 1843 um, was a, a bastard by the name of John Fremont. Um, people loved him. He was not a good man, apparently. History does not hold him in high revere, but he was a genius, and he was a man who foresaw um, scale. And when he came in with the Wilkes Exploratory Expedition in 1843, sailing in here under George Ed Edmonds, a, a marvelous surveyor and phenomenal sailor who retired as the Admiral of the Navy in 1873, um, uh, Fremont named our gate the Chrysophily. Golden Gate is a translation of the Latin word Chrysophily, all right? And so it is homage to the expectation that all trade with Asia would come through this port to the Americas. And he was essentially correct in that placement. So the Golden Gate, as we call it, is in fact the Chrysophily. And the Chrysophily is homage to the Chrysoceros. And so it puts us as a sister city, culturally, with Istanbul. So there's a story that as water people, we should know. That's a, like, and I had no idea about that, right? Fun story. So uh, uh, with that on this map, last thing we see is we see Ana Nuevo, we see San Jose, we see San Jose Mission, we see, we see for the first time San Francisco. But this map is an 1849 map that I'm using to reference a point. So by this time, the reasons that we have San Francisco is because we've... Uh, We've traded up. Um, this is uh, an 1844 engraving done by Pritchard's History of Man. And these are the hunters of the Bay region. Uh, these are the Clovis. Uh, they are Ohlone, Miwok. Uh, this is one of probably nine native peoples who lived along the Bay and in the nine counties around us, inland up to the Sierras. Um, this piece is a second edition um, because by 1855, after the death of Albert, Victorianism went prudish, and this man was naked in 1844, and so they put a pink loincloth on him. Um, one of the things that he does have, though, is a fox quill holder and a bow and arrow. Um, the fox quill holder is, an, is a fairly exciting piece that we still see in museums. Um, the secondary reason for pulling this piece up is if we take notice of the background, um, look at the shoreline and look at what we have as shoreline, there is very little flat water and almost everything comes to a cliff, a 30-foot facade. These aren't the best landing places. And uh, 
I'm going to pull up a few more images now and have a little fun with some imagery. I'll, I'll ask your indulgence in trying to get these to the scale that uh, they're relevant. But by 1846, this view represents the city of Yerba Buena. Um, this is a woodblock view from a newspaper in real time, uh, May 1st, 1846. And we're standing at essentially Powell Street, looking towards the Bay Bridge and Berkeley. Um, the big mountain in the background, no image. Sorry, I'm talking about something you guys don't see. There we go. <laughs> that's kind of where my wife lives all the time, right? in that state. So uh, you can have some empathy for her in that context. Anyway, um, in this image, um, we we'll see a few vessels. Uh, San Francisco is a maritime city. Uh, it does, excuse me, Yerba Buena is a maritime city established in about 1810. Uh, facilitates trade between Peruvians, Alaskans, Hawaiians, um, who all come here to service um, the local needs and attain wood and leather from the local rancho culture. Um, we have the Presidio starting in 1810. We have the Mission uh, and the Presidio really starting in 1776. But by 1810, it has been um, manned and outfitted. And that's just right over there. So the first military base on the west is right over there. It's a very small area. This is the town of Yerba Buena. Uh, to the right is Rincon Hill, where the Bay Bridge would connect. And to the left is Telegraph Hill. The island in the middle is what we call Yerba Buena Island, where Treasure Island would connect to it today. And the Bay Bridge runs to that. We're seeing Mount Diablo in the far background. Mount Diablo is a marvelous landmark. And anybody who does any dead reckoning sailing really makes use of these things on a clear day. And they are so advantageous. And it's marvelous, particularly to go out to the Delta and find yourself on the backside of Mount Diablo and see this huge blowout crater, by the way. <laughs> Volcano? Yeah, probably so. So um, this is one of my favorites. And then one more. Now we're going to get into uh, another view. This is going back the other direction, looking at the town where we were just looking from. And this is Russian and Knob Hills uh, as viewed from basically standing, oh, like maybe just, um, where's your office, Alan? Davis Street? Yeah, yeah, Davis and Pacific. So, so basically Pacific Avenue and the Embarcadero today is where we're looking from. And everything towards the city is landfill from that point. And that's what's indicated here. This is the original town and we see the customs house and a few small structures. And this again is 1846. So where we are here, there's nothing over here. Um, but what is happening is we're starting to have presence and the Americans come in 1847. And with that, they take possession of the Presidio. They take possession of Portsmouth Square and the customs and all the bureaucracy. And from 1847 until 1850, San Francisco operates as a quasi-independent republic. It has American um, authority, but in fact, um, and it has elections and things, but in fact is really not um, going along very well. It's, uh, it's, excuse me, I'm getting distracted. Ron, my time, I gotta move along here for a second. I'm gonna get up here and get some images for people. Um, so that we can kind of run through a couple of things. Uh, the Presidio, sorry. Come on, there we go. Not being very cooperative. I'm gonna try this and there we go. Let's see if I can expand it. <clears throat> All right, well, I'm going to try this. All of a sudden, I'm having some technical things. It keeps popping up here. Uh, San Francisco is a maritime city. Um, we have inner telegraph station and the outer telegraph station. Here's a quick image of the inner telegraph station. This is our namesake for Telegraph Hill. Um, this is about 1850. When we start looking um, around San Francisco at this time, what we start seeing is abandoned ships. <laughs> so this is an early shot.
of San Francisco's harbor in 1850. And we speak frequently about the ships in the harbor. Well, here we are. Um, this is looking from California Street towards uh, Telegraph Hill. And what we have is hundreds upon hundreds and hundreds of, of vessels. Uh, with that comes such things as repurposing. We're doing water lots. Uh, this piece is an 1850s view of the Apollo store ship and the Niantic Hotel. There we go. On the right-hand side is the Niantic. It had been a store ship. It had become a prison. Uh, the store ship on the left was the Apollo. It was the brig for a while. Um, this is Sansom Street. Uh, so what was just a moment ago ships sitting in water, uh, less than a year later, has become a uh, landfill with boats upon it. Uh, and we see that when we look at the 1853 the 1853 map of San Francisco. This map is the one that shows us our original shoreline and shows us how quickly the city had grown. I'm going to go into the cove and this is original shoreline. Right here, all of that, all of that is landfill less than three years after the gold rush by 1852. That's all of north of Market from the ferry building all the way to the Transamerica Pyramid running up to Telegraph Hill. We're very quick. We're very industrious. We have sand. We have a lot of reasons. So San Francisco is changing very quickly and our shoreline is changing. South of Market will turn into um, the same landfill within another five years. So these guys are going like mad. Great guns and great survey. So this is there we go. This is a marvelous piece that I want to share. Um, it is a viewpoint from this is San Francisco 1855. It's an oil painting unattributed. Um, the date is fairly concise because of the date on the canvas, which is a fabricated canvas brought uh, on a vessel here and uh, has a date on it. Um, we are standing at essentially Van Ness and Francisco, looking right at us right here. The um, first dip uh, brings you in to Chestnut and Divisadero. Uh, it then goes out, and if we look closely at that sand spit there, we see water. That would be what Chrissy Field and the estuary we've created there is replacing, right? So we, we remove this, and all this became landfill. Um, we are presently about a mile out to shore. Um, Chestnut and Divisadero is the shoreline, and we've landfilled this area um, starting in about 1901. And by 1915, we put a fair out here. In 1929, we formalized this water line. But this image is um, one that nobody's seen. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine at his 99th passed away recently, and this was what he'd left me among many great memories. And this piece was a piece that he uh, salvaged from a home on Arguello, uh, Jordan Park, back in the 60s, and it was being thrown away. Uh, and he went to the owners and said, you know, can I have this? And they said yes. And so um, he took that home and, and had it for years. And when we uh, met 40 years ago, uh, I never expected him to have uh, uh, been a friend for the rest of his life or mine. Uh, but when I visit, we would speak about this image. And we'd speak about the nature of San Francisco at that time. Um, you're walking. Um, there's a pathway. And there's a house in the foreground. And to the left of that house, we see a pathway. That's the Presidio Road. That becomes Union Street. And that's a dirt road that's, that kind of meanders down, um, taking us to... Uh, what will become distilleries, breweries, fisheries. Um, this is the area known as Spring Valley. Um, and so we're in kind of a the edge of Spring Valley. We're out in the valley of its, uh, of its uh, lagoon here. Um, to the white, 
we see uh, Punta Blanco, that is what the Spanish called it. We called it Black Point and subsequently now call it Fort Mason. Um, all of the sand was removed. Um, next to that sand, uh, in the foreground of it, we see a very dark line of trees. Um, that dark line of trees are what we call black willows. And I really want you to look closely at those um, because this is one of the rare opportunities we get to visualize what the indigenous plant species were in this part of town. This is before the Eastern ideal of parks and bucalia came in. And so for the most part, what we have are um, some grazing grasses from the Spanish, what we call permanent pasture, but predominantly sea grasses and sea plants. Um, we don't have a lot of trees yet because they haven't been planted. As I'd mentioned 200 years ago, there were no uh, trees on this part. We were a sand dune. So this is a marvelous image and it's really something that I just love sharing. Um, anybody who sails can really recognize it. The, the dead reckoning of the Marin Coast headlands is so familial to all of us, uh, particularly standing right here on a day like today. <laughs> that was, I was hoping to be able to actually have the example right there. But, but um, this is a great example of why we sailed past the mouth of the bay for 200 years and didn't see it. The mouth of the bay is two miles wide. The Golden Gate entrance between Point Reyes and San Pedro Point is about 30, 40 miles, and the Farallons are 27 miles off. So we would have had no idea that this calm, beautiful environment would have exactly existed in here until we came and discovered it much later. So this is a marvelous image. It's one I wanted to share. There's only a couple more things I want to do um, because they're kind of some fun things that relate to here. And one of them is the uh, uh, location of this club in uh, 1869. So let's see, Mission Bay. Yes, there it is. Yes, your parent club, San Francisco. That's right, um, the transition of things. So this piece, here's Mission Bay. And uh, Mission Bay with Mission Creek at the bottom, we're facing east in this map. And I'm going to keeps coming in here and coming in and coming in a minute and then I'm going to scroll down and what we find is Hobbs Wharf right in the middle of our screen and this would be the site of the original Yacht Club. The inland side of this bridge, this is a wooden bridge known as Long Bridge, it was built in 69 and it becomes 4th Street and ultimately is the defining line, everything inland from that drains at low tide and becomes mud flats. This map indicates in the right hand side that the mud is 17 to 18 feet thick. <laughs> That's a hell of mud flats. <laughs> I do not want to get stuck in that. But um, uh, this is where we dumped most of the 1906 earthquake rubble. Uh, so as we had to move stuff in, we filled in Mission Bay um, quite effectively. But this, in fact, is Hobbs Wharf. And we see the wharf, we see the width of 4th Street, we see the mud level, and we see the buildings at the apex there. So that's really a marvelous little piece that comes from George Allard, the Salt Marsh and Tidelands Commission. These were water lots that ultimately we expected to, uh, to fill in. Everybody's seen water lots before, but I thought it would be nice to see these water lots because... Um, San Francisco had, when we filled the bay, let's see if I can get this to work for me. Oh yes, I know how to work it, full screen. That is a water lot. So um, I'd mentioned the store ship Niantic and the Apollo as a maritime city. Flat land, pre-industrial age, is the only land that you can really use. Um, barrels roll down hills, they kill people. So you need flat land, everything's in a barrel, everything's in, you know, stored a certain way. Um, so we're filling in the bay. In the middle, right here, is the store ship Apollo that has been brought in, um, or the Niantic. Uh, one of these two, I've yet to fully, this is definitely Sansom Street, and we're in the right area. Um, the Niantic came in on July 5th, 1849, and beached itself and became the first buried ship. There are 150 buried ships down in this cove, and we've every time we make a high rise, we have to do it. But in the foreground, we see this, right? So that's a water lot, and somebody has bought that, and they've staked it. Now, their responsibility can go two ways. They can wait, or they can come in and start dumping debris. They can put in a case on siding, and they can start filling in with sand and any kind of garbage they want their own, that's the in, in, independent industry. And in doing so, we'll look, and we look back here, there are actually a couple of islands in the background over here. That's an island. 
That's actually a water lot already filled in there. Um, here's another ship which has been beached. Uh, so we see this is underway, um, so much so that when we go a year later, these are done. Um, we are not messing around. Everything west of here is sand, so we got a lot of sand. Um, we've got a lot of free stuff. Oh, so this is um, uh, Sansom at uh, uh, just uh, Sacramento and correct. Thank you, Sacramento and Clay, right? And uh, and where uh, if we go just a little further south, and which oh, it would, uh, would be a, a fifty var a lot, which would be one thirty seven by one thirty seven, uh, and then it could be subdivided. Uh, which would be as little as 25 by 137. Uh, so 50 VAR, anybody know what a VAR is? A VAR is a Mexican pace. It's 33 inches, and all the mission towns are measured in VAR, so their surveys are in VAR. So we have to translate them into miles and other kinds of things. But uh, San Francisco, everything's 50 VAR, 137 feet by 137 feet. This looks like a, a 25 or 50 by 137. Um, if I can scroll over just a little bit, the other thing that's on here, yeah, so the building to the left there, it's just difficult to see. It says Sutter Ironworks. Um, that's uh, just one block south uh, of Market, right? So we're right about where Clay and Sacramento and Sansom, and they all intersect with Market Street, just about a half a block north and a half a block south. Um, a very important kind of industrial neighborhood at that time that becomes our financial district. Uh, I gotta do a couple more things. How am I doing on time? All right, good. A um, couple of things I wanted to show us that are right here. This is a view from Pier Street looking to about where we're standing uh, from the top of Pacific Heights, Broadway. Thank you. Um, that's probably the Presidio Road in the foreground, Union Street. And the background, we actually see the sand dune that we pointed out in the, in the pictures. And this is titled The Chinese Gardens on Lombard Street. This is 1895. So um, when we use the name Cow Hollow, we're referring to the fact that there's still ag in city until about 1906. Um, cows, big cows, big numbers of cows are outlawed by 1868. But there is still a, a, a dairy farm here. In fact, the dairy farm that is on Blackstone, Anybody know where Blackstone is? It's just right over here, not far at all. Blackstone is at an odd angle coming off of uh, Franklin or Goff, and it, in fact, is on the old grid of the Lagoon Survey, and it is, in fact, an 1861 farmhouse. It still sits there, and it's been absorbed by the new grid. But I love showing this piece because it just never occurred to me um, the order and simplicity of, of ag uh, in our neighborhood. And then we go a little bit further, and... This is just a little bit further down, looking down at Fort Point. Um, and again, to the right, we have a couple of cannons defending the Golden Gate, overlooking agriculture, then at the Presidio. Um, these are photos that uh, I came through with Charlie and going through his stuff and uh, cleaning up. And they're photos that I'd never seen before. So many of them I really wanted to share. Um, I think this is us blowing up Blossom Rock. based on location. So it's kind of fun. Um, this is the uh, early northern seawall. Um, I might comment that this is likely the spit of land at which this building was built on the end of. All right. This, the deed on this property is specific about its creation and being on the end of a spit of sand that was pre-existing for recreational water uses. Um, this is uh, that space. So we're kind of looking at where we are, which is really just a joy to find. And then in summary and conclusion, the last map seems to be a big file. This is the O'Shaughnessy map of San Francisco. And it's a full contour map. If we get in a little closer, we'll see that it's topographic. It has all of the all of the topography um, done by O'Shaughnessy, a great engineer who worked for the Spring Valley. This is post-1915 PPIE, Pan Pacific Exposition, and as a result, um, it actually has original shoreline where we are, so you can kind of get an idea. We see the aquatic park, we see our yacht harbor, 
And where the Yacht Harbor is on the left center, I'm going to go one more size up, um, we see a line that comes in and creates our original shoreline right here. All right, and then to Fort Point, and then down that way. So here's our spit of land as it came out, and here we are, and this Yacht Harbor is created. And so this is the first map to document our existence on this location. To the left of us, we've got great documentation of the Presidio. To the right is the grid of San Francisco. And in the center is a marvelous topography of the city. So that's how we got here. <laughs> I hope that was OK. <laughs> Sure, thank you. Welcome again to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Our guest speaker today, Jimmy Shine, runs with his wife, Marty, Shine and Shine Antique Maps and Books on uh, Grant Street in San Francisco's beautiful North Beach. And if you haven't been there, it's an incredibly fun visit. It's completely, completely fun. So, Jimmy, um, okay, surveyors. Surveyors haven't done badly in history. Uh, wasn't George Washington a surveyor? And so tell us some other famous surveyors. Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, and, and isn't it the well, case that, that George Washington took a little bit of each of the lots or many of the lots that he surveyed? Oh, so lots of times in the, in the case of surveying, um, it wouldn't be uncommon in a barter culture to uh, pay the surveyor in the land that he's surveying. Um, and that was particularly at a time when uh, land was there for the claiming, right? Um, the aspect on surveying, surveyors often are operational guys. They tend to be more tactile. Um, the guys that we hear about are the map makers, Ortelius, Mercator, uh, people who uh, take this data and compile it and do the math. Um, uh, before 1772, California was documented as an island, right? So there's a whole hundred years where California is an island on maps. And this was based on the fallacy of the, of the Sea of Cortez, and nobody wanted to sail up there because they're giant squid and they're giant whales, and nobody knows how to swim, and it's all bad omens, and there's no wind. So they don't really go up there. And it isn't until a, a Franciscan priest goes to 1701 and walks overland to get there. So, but with all of that, everybody knows Franciscan, not uh, Kino. Everybody knows Ortelius. Everybody, but the surveyors often run in anonymity. Um, the change in that is when we have a county surveyor. Almost anybody who does any building, anybody who does any construct, is working and has a surveyor. Um, surveyors and the Bureau of Survey and Mapping in the city of San Francisco is paramount to the creation of new housing. Right. So surveying is very much an operational skill. Uh, California Land Surveyors Association probably has 3,000, 3,500 members. Um, and they're broken down in chapters. We lecture to them quite a bit. Um, but in general, uh, there aren't a lot of famous surveyors. People like uh, uh, Washington, people like Jefferson, uh, because they had those skills, were able to uh, be in the middle of central to many, many deals. Um, you can't confirm land ownership without a survey. And the math has to be right, and it has to stand up. And so everything's based there. So the maps you showed were amazing. Where do you get old great maps like this? Yeah. Give us a range of the locations. Uh, from you guys. Uh, <laughs> there's always everybody in an audience who collects maps or parent collected maps. So uh, nowadays, having been in this business for 20 years, um, uh, the, the best maps are already in private hands, and they come from individuals who already own them, and they're ready to divest them. Uh, the majority of the quantity of maps comes from academic institutions. Almost everything's being digitized today. If you want to remain engaged, uh, most grad students, they don't go down to the basement of the library anymore where I grew up hanging out. They go online and they get on their computer. And if it's not digitized, they don't know about it. So what universities are doing is they're digitizing their content. They don't pay for a library and they don't pay for climate control. They're not paying a retirement account and it's cheaper to store. So all of a sudden that access is being cost effectively managed but we also find things that were in obsolescence in the basin of the library are being re-engaged with. So I've had a great number of young people who have found us and are absolutely blown away because they're seeing the tactile, tangible map that they had studied for the first time that their university just digitized five years ago. Um, or they, uh, 
nowadays there's a great mapper by the name of David Rumsey, a San Franciscan who, uh, in short, digitized 130,000 maps before he gave them all to Stanford. Um, Stanford, by obligation, is required to allow those maps to be accessed by the public for free. And as such, this collection is both available in a tactile manageable form as well as in a digital form to the general populace. And in doing so, um, I can, any map that I don't have, I can look to see. The majority of the maps that you saw today would have been maps that would have come through our store and I would have scanned them because I would have only gotten one shot. I would have only seen them once and when I sell them I likely never see them again. Um, that's the nature of maps. They're not, they're, they're mass produced but I don't expect to find ten of each one, right? I expect to find one or two if I'm lucky. Um, so the maps that we have uh, come from a great variety of places. Anytime an auction house wants to clear house, um, we get a phone call. Um, uh, you're a map guy and you're selling 5,000 maps and, and the auction house sells 4,862. What are they going to do with the rest of them? Well, the guy doesn't want anything back from them. He sold them all. He doesn't want to hear about it. They sit in their shelves for five years and they call me and say, Jimmy, make us an offer. So that's how I get on this work, find some of the best maps. So tell us of a story, a fun story on you finding a map. Oh, uh, so everything from uh, one of the great maps, there's a great map maker, a San Francisco, who I've just written a book about. His name was Ken Cathcart, and his estate came to me through a woman who worked for the Flying Tigers. Flying Tigers is the predecessor to FedEx, and essentially were a cargo airline. But she was in the days of glamour flying, was a stewardess, and she traveled the world, and her basement, she filled with stuff. And when she sold me Ken Cathcart's estate, which she had collected, long story short, I went and cleared out the basement. And I just the last thing I did was move the, the rubber mat. And this basement, of course, is a seaman's crib. Um, it literally has four rooms and a toilet in the middle. And it's made from merchant seamen, 35 bucks a month. And the ceiling's six feet. And, uh, and the last thing I do before I clear it out is I move this rubber mat. And underneath it is a 1710 Herman Mole map of the Roman Empire. It's folded over. It's kind of beat up, but it's a seven foot long map, three feet by seven feet. And then, you know, it's a $3,500 map just out of all this crap. So it's just like, <laughs> what? Um, so that was kind of fun. I've also had, you know, there's a great map maker by the name of Hondius, and one of his descendants came and showed up at our store with all of the representatives, uh, with all of the publications that the family had ever made. So Henricus Hondius and Jodicus Hondius, these are great map makers from Holland, and their name is De Holmes, which means the hound, um, but in Latin it's Hondius, and so important as map makers, they change their name to the Latin name. So this American man shows up and he's got Jodicus Hondius' Atlas Major, he's got Henricus Hondius' Atlas Major, he's got Henricus Hondius' Atlas Minor. He shows up with about a million dollars worth of books, and since they're the books by the guys who made them, it was about three million dollars worth of books. And he kind of had no idea what he had. They'd been keeping them in a plastic tub in the garage and taking care <laughs> of them because they loved them, because it was family pieces, but the innate value and, and of course, and we said, well, you, this is what you need to do and take care of them. And we kind of let that one go. Um, most people, uh, I should point out, most dealers would never let that guy out of the building. Uh, they'd figure a way to try to buy them or do something with them. And we respected his privacy, and ultimately the family lives in San Diego, and, and we helped them, you know, figure out how to manage them. And that was the end of that job for me. I don't think I've ever called them. That was 15 years ago. I don't think I've ever called them or asked them about them or anything. I, I think most of my contemporaries look at me and go, why wouldn't you do that? Well, that was, that was their family thing. That was their privacy. So when you buy maps, are you generally buying the map or a lot of property and archival material, including the map? How often are you just seeing the map and getting the map? Oh, um, what do you pay for maps? Right. So I try to buy maps on their own. Um, I came at things backwards uh, with a lack of formal education. Um, I would discover a map and it would intrigue me. And then I'd realize, oh, this came from a book. And I'd go and find the book, and then I'd study the book, and then that would educate me. But the map is shorthand on the book. Thank you. Um, the map is shorthand on the book, and I wasn't a big reader. I was a map guy. I've always been a map guy. Spatial memory and those things were how I connected and communicated. So um, uh, there's a, a process that we never really had to partic particularly engage ourselves in. There's a dismantling. Um, the majority of maps come from books. Uh, the majority of books that don't survive, the one thing they might save will be the map. Um, whether it's failed, uh, any book made in the 19th century is made of garbage, basically cardboard and short fiber acidic material that just sitting in the shelves has a propensity for decomposing. Anything pre-industrial age is just the opposite. 
um, it's made with inherently long fibered papers that are acid free and if you put them in the right environment they'll last for hundreds of years. Um, so uh, understanding how things are made, understanding how to treat them, how to store them, this facilitates you know maps and where they come from. For me the majority of our maps come from as I mentioned, from individuals or from academic institutions. Um, and I buy almost exclusively maps with, I buy, I might buy a pile of 300 maps and of course then in it 10% will be non-maps, right? So I'm, I'm shooting for maps and, uh, and I try to kind of a shotgun technique, um, which is just try to, everybody's from some place and nobody's from the same place. And everybody has a needle in a haystack they want to find. <laughs> so I try to have a whole drawer full of needles. So what percent of the people who buy maps from you are institutions versus collectors? Mm, it's both. Um, what percent? Probably 35% institutional because of the numbers that they buy. Um, it might only be three institutions, but when they buy, they'll buy 40 maps or something. Um, whereas most individuals, that's a lifetime, you know, buy three maps in a lifetime from me. Uh, that would be the norm. Um, so uh, percentage-wise, one institution covers uh, three months of individual buying, right? Uh, you know, in many regards. So who has the most maps in the world? You know, most California maps. Mm. Who has, what institutions have maps? And who has the most? So Stanford uh, has become the center for mapping for both contemporary and um, uh, historic mapping because of the Rumsey collection. Uh, because of the Green Library and the Repensi and previous alumni and alumnus who've, who've made the quests relating to maps already there. Um, How Cal many do they have? Uh, you know, if I'm going to grab a number, I'm going to say somewhere under 200,000, but right about there. Um, Cal uh, Berkeley has is the repository of all the decennio maps. All California maps that predate Americanization, all land grant maps, all rancho maps, these maps were manuscript maps. And most individuals who were the recipients of land grants at some point gave these maps to Cal. Cal became the depository, they became the archivists and the curators of such, and that material is available to us digitally. And it's an important, important archive. And as such, anybody in the realm of San Francisco and Decenio mapping and thing like that, Cal is very much on the radar in the Bancroft Library. Bancroft was a printer who made maps. His request was to create this library, so it's a, a nice legacy. So we're very blessed in that we're here. Other places would be Room M at the New York Public Library, Yale, um, uh, Vatican, yeah, and Yale. Oh, the Vatican, yes, of course. Oh my God, yeah. The, the best map collection would be in the Vatican. Um, absolutely, from, from the hallway to the map room, uh, which is all maps, tax maps. Um, the Chinese also, uh, and the Arabs. Uh, the first maps, the biggest maps of the ancient world were giant silver discs, um, and they were maps of the world, right? And uh, so there's, there's a culture of mapping. So when we get into the big power bases or the older cultures, then we see that mapping exists. But the Vatican's a great example of, of the ornateness and the wealth of maps and information. So welcome again to our online viewers to the Wednesday Outing Lunch. And our speaker today is Jim Shine of Shine and Shine Antique Maps and Books. Now I'm going to keep asking our fascinating guest questions, but if you have one here in the audience, hold your hand up and the mic will come to you and we'll, happy, we'll happily ask your question. Now the first guy to hold his hand up is my buddy Fritz Maytag. And I have to say also that Fritz used to have calendars at Anchor Steam here and for a dozen sure. years he had incredibly great map calendars. And I just got through saying Fritz how many were there that he said there were a dozen oh, and and he and and in doing so there's one of the ones they did was an 1894 view of San Francisco as seen in 1846-47 and that image is so confusing for people because it says 1846-47 right on it that must be from when it's from but it's in fact an effort in the 1890s to show what it looked like 50 years earlier and have people like Mariano Vallejo and Edwin Lease and other significant members sign it and say this is what it looked like but and then the anchor steam reprint I have one a month that comes in and goes what's it worth <laughs> <laughs> what a month it comes in and, asks, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and, and, and I won't and I won't yeah they come to and I won't tell you what I sell them for <laughs> <laughs> Fritz has a question use the mic printed printed on our archival paper yeah, yeah they were good on they're on good stock exactly yeah. right and we worked very hard at reprinting yeah. Uh, my favorite was a gigantic painting of the city from, I'm not sure, 1880 or 90, 
with a view down over the city and the Jewish cemetery right in front. And the, um, anyway, the man who owned it finally agreed to let us copy it, photograph it, copy it, print it, if we promised to keep his name secret. He had promised his wife that he would stop buying these big things. <laughs> it was, he stored it in a hidden storage locker. <laughs> I just wondered if you'd ever seen a treasure map that you thought was in any way legitimate or yeah. interesting. Yeah. O only, only once um, that, that felt that it was the real deal. Um, I have come across manuscript maps that are gold mine maps. Uh, so being in California, um, and, and those are exciting um, because they are uh, hand-drawn and um, uh, some, so some are commercially hand-drawn by a surveyor in the 1920s in the gold rush of the 20s. But I, the treasure map that I found, in fact, was a, um, uh, a map uh, showing X marks the spot um, and with a code that I never, that I never deciphered um, that said, uh, uh, here, here be what ye seek. Uh, right, <laughs> <laughs> cryptic, but that, um, and more frequently though, people come in and ask me for treasure maps. I find that funny because if I had one, I wouldn't sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I'm on a, a lot of maps. Would you explain what that's? Where do you see that? Well, it has something to do with Mount Diablo being the oh, uh, sure, sure, the line. So, that's right. So um, Mount Diablo is the center and origin, it's ground zero for all surveys of the Western United States, right? We talked about when we sailed into the bay, we used Table Mountain and Blue Mountain and Diablo Mountain as our original triangulation. To Table the, Mountain being Mount Cam, Mount Blue Mountain being Twin Peaks. Mike? Mike? Bob, what's happening with our guest, Mike? Thanks, very good, thank you. Um, so uh, the Mount Diablo meridian, baseline meridian, and we have three meridians. We have um, one in Los Angeles, one halfway up, and Mount Diablo. And we establish those um, officially uh, in the 1853 Pacific Railroad Survey um, and extrapolated from there on for those three meridians uh, so that we wouldn't have to continually triangulate and do the math all the way back up to Mount Diablo. But um, with that, if you go to, uh, there's a park in Mount Diablo, if you go up there, there'll be a big obelisk and a marker. Um, and, uh, and it calls, yep, there we go. And it's uh, ground zero. Uh, so um, there's a grid called the Township and Range Grid. Anybody familiar with that? So the Township and Range Grid <laughs> is um, Township uh, is north, south, and range is east, west. And so instead of saying north, south, east, west, they said township and range. And it's enumerated. So as you go up, it's one north, one south, one east, one west. This then has a symbols where we see T1N, R4S, right? Or R4W. And what that is, in fact, is a grid which we establish. First, it's the intersections every six square miles we'd have an intersection, we establish a grid. That grid is the basis for our GPS today. Um, we were so thorough in our surveying and from the get-go had such good fortune in creating with Mount Diablo and working outward. That's why we have a proprietary product in GPS and, our, and owned by our government is because starting in 1854, we started mapping it, starting with six, with intersections that were six miles apart from each other in all directions. And then we started filling in those boxes and more and more and more, we filled in the data. Now we're filled in down to about three inches. But when we started in 1853, it was dots six miles apart from each other. And Mount Diablo was the starting point. So we've got to ask someone who's collected maps made with quill pins and an old you know, uh, paper, what do you think of Google Maps? Talk to us. Hmm. Wow, um, Google Maps makes you know mapping contemporary and relevant. Um, it is amazing. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm not a huge fan of colonial overlords, uh, so. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Not a fan of colonial overlords. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so conceptually, well, let me put it this way. You know, um, uh, in the realm of mapping, uh, we have bird's eye views. We have perspective. Uh, mapping, uh, for the most part, is a very human and one-to-one -one scale kind of thing. Um, Google Maps takes it and puts you as if you're God. I'm looking down on something, and it separates the map viewer from the individual, um, and it creates a, a dystopia between those two realms. I, I don't, uh, I just see that as an effect, and in doing so, um, the impact of one doesn't support the impact of the other. They are different things that provide different functions. Um, people who are engaged in problem solving uh, will use both of those tools um, with equal success. Um, but if you're looking for something to tell you what to do, um, you're not going to get that from a paper map. Uh, that's what Google Maps provides you, is the ability not to have to necessarily uh, problem solve to get yourself there. Um, it's a multiple choice re reality. Um, that's a philosophical viewpoint. I don't know if I can articulate it any better. So in history, uh, serves me right for asking a religious question, I can see. Uh, tell us, who are the, who are the famous, famous map makers? Who are the great map makers in history? Uh, so in history, it starts some um, uh, Ptolemy uh, was a man who made maps in the Roman times. Uh, his ancestors, uh, forebearers, were both uh, 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 pharaohs as well as uh, Caesars. And in 150 AD, Ptolemy was a map maker under the post in the Caesar period. And in the Crusades of the 1400s, an atlas of his was found in the market in Istanbul and Constantinople. And that gave the Middle European golden age its view into what the Romans knew in regards to mapping, what they perceived as the world they knew. Um, so Ptolemy is very important. Then you go to uh, Ortelius Mercator, um, and the names go on and on. Now, early on, there are only um, uh, America is named by Germans. There's a map in 1507. That's where America is put on. So it's, it's uh, de Vries Waldsmuller. Waldsmuller is an obviously an important guy. The German map makers working out of Nuremberg in the 1500s were hugely important, particularly in their time. Whether their names hold up, not so much. Just don't name it as speaker. As a speaker. So, uh, and, and those names continue on. For us in this country, uh, Thomas Bowen is a name who's uh, still in business in Philadelphia today, producing maps. Um, his fifth great-grandfather was... Uh, 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 map maker to King George III, um, made the eight, 1747 atlas that Captain Bly used in order to circumnavigate the globe uh, when his ship, the Bounty, was stolen from him. He specifically references Bowen's uh, 1747 terrestrial atlas. So there are a lot of players, the French, the English, the Germans, the Dutch, and then the Americans. In this country, would be Admiral Perry, 1855. Um, for us in this bay, um, something like Humboldt, uh, somebody like uh, Fremont, um, George Edmonds, probably one of the greatest uh, map makers slash sailors slash naval officers um, who uh, named and surveyed Richardson's Bay, uh, did all kinds of stuff around here. Most people don't know who he is. You know, great guy. Yes, another great question. And actually the genesis of your, your talk today. Yes. Indeed. So uh, I was just wondering if anybody is making beautiful creative maps currently. Yeah, um, uh, there are a number of companies that have endeavored to. There's an artist by the name of Blaze Domino, great name, and uh, and he once in a while shoots me an email and says, "Here's my latest creation," and it's something really rather ornate and kind of uh, 16th, 15th, 17th century early and ornamental. And it's nice because I have had people come in and go, "You know, I'm looking for a map of San Francisco, maybe something from like the 1700s." <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 the early 1700s. The early, yeah, possible. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and and I really like to accommodate people. What what's the most you've ever paid for a map? Paid. Paid. Not much. I'm cheap. <laughs> uh, no. Give us um, a number. You know. Uh, yeah. His wife's yeah, here. She's like, looking at me like like uh, buying boats. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say how, for how a single map probably not more than five grand. Five uh, grand. Yeah. What's the most you've sold a map for? Uh. Um, you know, I have uh, the uh, George Emmons map of Sausalito. I sold to Graham Orator for thirty grand. Um, it was a deal. Um, there's uh, no <laughs> of course. Was, no, it was. Uh, he turned around and sold that for forty-five. Um, like two days later, um, uh, I just didn't have the client base, you know. So I was happy to sell it. Um, uh, w. F. Boardman was the uh, county surveyor for Alameda County, a really talented surveyor and a talented map maker. And uh, 
uh, I bought a collection, uh, Sanders collection, and, and um, some of the maps in there were manuscript maps, and they were pretty exciting. They were really beautiful pieces and very much 1868. And I sold several of those. Um, and, you know, Rumsey's bought a few pieces from me, but uh, for the most part, uh, I'd say probably 45 to 50 grand is the most expensive. Map How many sold. maps would you sell a year? Oh, geez, I don't know. Could you typically a year? A thousand? Yeah, a thousand, maybe more. A thousand um, maps? Yeah. Yeah, more than a thousand. And how does your collection grow every year? About how many? You th well, what's yeah. the net growth? I don't know. I mean, that's that's a. 5, a year. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. So, so, so you get you get five thousand a year in, and you sell a thousand. So your inventory is building. Yeah. Well, I, let's put it this way: I started the business with two hundred and twenty maps fifteen years ago, and I'm up to nine thousand. And I've been selling maps, but I know I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> Lance Berg has a question. Lance. Uh, so to go back the previous question. Uh, clearly for some people maps are an absolute passion yeah. and there is great beauty in, in some maps. Why do you think that the USGS topographical maps aren't anywhere near as beautiful as the Swiss topographical maps from Kimberly and Frey? Oh, you know, um, the responsibility of government uh, expenditures. Um, our topos are great for me personally, I love our topos right up to about 1950. Uh, and then they changed the color palette to green and yellow. And I don't care for green and yellow. It's pretty subjective, <laughs> right? Um, but prior to that, uh, they're blue and tan. Um, and they're a marvelous palette. And then uh, the earlier ones, the agronomic maps, the soil maps, um, uh, printing technology kind of drives mapping. And so in the turn of the 20th century, uh, chromolithography is inexpensive. So you can have 35 colors for the price of what you used to have two colors. And with that, then um, those maps are really exciting and really fun. And you get soil maps and geological maps where printing technology is pushing the ability to make the map. Um, but in the case of like the English ordinance or the Swiss ordinance, they spent more money on that series um, in that that series was seminal for their time frame. For us, by that time, um, we had started that series in 1854, and the topos came in in 1896. We're 50 years down the line, and again, the printing technology was driving everything. So as long as they did 20-foot contour lines in a scale of 1 over 62,500, that was considered the goal, um, because the goal was about infill of information and once you had it done at one at 62,500 then you went into 32,250 and then you went into 16 you know and this was kind of the our government's thinking whereas in the case of particularly the English was a goal to incorporate all items all content and they had a legend that was four times like our legend is pretty deep it's got maybe 190 200 icons but the Swiss one has probably 500 icons to describe what's going on so that's partly why I think yeah. So now if you look, if you fly over San Francisco, the footprint is 49 miles. Yeah. But this is after the water lots were filled in. Do you have any notion about how, what was the footprint before? Oh, when, originally? Yeah, in 1700. Uh, yeah, you know, you're probably 40 or less. I mean, the 49 miles, you have to remember, we actually own out to the middle of the Bay Bridge, right? So the city line goes, and, and we own to the north tower of the Golden Gate. So when people say 49 miles, do they mean seven by seven yeah. of what you think of terrestrial San Francisco, or do you mean legal? Uh, seven by seven is the legal definition, really, because the, we, it's, kind of, it's kind of like where's North Beach? Um, there was a North Beach at one place in one time, and it's been <laughs> landfilled, but North Beach runs from the Transamerica Pyramid all the way to Bay Street. Anywhere along there could be North Beach. That was right? North Beach. So I think the seven by seven thing is that kind of subjectivity, where you know, it's up, there's a lot of personal interpretation. One more. Yes, another question for the audience. I have uh, two brief questions. One is, uh, are those extraordinary maps you showed us today, are they available anywhere for us to see them yes. again? And secondly, if, if a map has been scanned, does it diminish in value? Right. Both good questions. Um, yes, uh, uh, I have all of these maps available digitally. Um, also, many of them, David Rumsey and Rumsey's site um, has online. Uh, and they allow exportation, download at very high resolution, free of charge. Um, I charge $25 for a file like that, to be honest, because most of the time the ones that I have are somewhat proprietary to my time. But um, And then, uh, yes, is there an impact? There is the occasional buyer who might pull the trigger on the original piece at $300 and definitely loves having an out at $40, right? 
And for me, I think it's important. The accessibility of maps was always why I was a mapper and why I enjoyed them. They were affordable. And so many of like those Spanish maps, those are million dollar maps. We'll never own those. Um, those are just too high up there. But the ability to have the digital file and have it available is really is pretty great. So some things, they're just too big a price disparity for there to really be an impact. But something like that La Perouse, uh, one of the Bay from 1798, that map has dropped in value a bit in the digital age. Um, it's one of the few that has, uh, but in general, no, they seem to attract different audiences for different purposes. And, and in many cases, an original map owner will own the digital file as well. Um, with, as my eyes have aged, I've really enjoyed digital maps so much more because I can blow things up and see icons that I didn't know were there before. I literally, I'm like, I'm, I discover something new on a map, even ones that I've looked at for years every time I look at it. So, Well, Jimmy Shine of Shine and Shine Antique Maps, thank you very much for sharing your enthusiasm, your interest, your knowledge, and a symbol of what you know about maps with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, the luncheon is adjourned. <laughs> thank you, Ron. Hey, Paul. Paul, do you have a question?